This podcast is brought to you by the Disabled But Not Really Foundation, a local Kansas City nonprofit organization that pushes to instill a physical limitless mindset that breeds courage, confidence, and competence within the disabled community. You can follow and support Disabled But Not Really on social media or go visit their website at disabledbutnotreally.org. Their work and their mission is to really impact communities and make more people understand the benefits of inclusivity. Say live. Oh, we're live. Good morning. Good Sunday morning, everyone. I am April Jackson with Sunday Safe Spaces. And um, I don't know how your screen is oriented, but to my right, which is showing left because it's mirroring me, is Mr. Wesley Hamilton. Good morning. Um, we are so excited to be with you all this morning to recognize and acknowledge its disability uh, awareness employment month. I probably said all of that wrong, <laughs> but you know, we have all these wonderful conversations about the intersectionality of um, black folks primarily. We're centered around um, those of us who are identified as Black Americans and, you know, Black diaspora, like not just Americans. Um, and then the intersectionality of that with dis uh, disabilities. Um, this is a month that focuses on um, everyone with disabilities, those you can see and those you cannot see. Um, and the uh, employing people with disabilities, bringing people into the workforce, acknowledging and accepting. <laughs> us in, in all of who we are, because the bottom line is that we're all human beings. And Wesley and I have had some great conversation on that this month, like <laughs> yeah. about us in the workspace. So Miss Ashley Lawrence is here with us. Good morning, Ashley. Ashley. Good morning. <laughs> and she's going to like dive into this topic with us. So I'm going to let Wes say his piece and then we're going to pass it to Lauren and Join us for your tea, your water, your coffee, and just conversation. Yeah, absolutely. Um, <laughs> I see you, Ashley. Yes, uh, yes. <laughs> all right, all right. Um, definitely getting up. I had a long travel day yesterday, so it's a good thing we're talking about this topic because I think it's important to understand that um, – you know, when you think about disability employment awareness, it's not just about individuals with disabilities. It's about making those work uh, places welcoming, understanding um, for individuals with disabilities, you know. And so all to say, I'm really excited about this topic because there's a lot of different levels to it. Um, and... You know, like last month was Spinal Cord Injury Awareness Month, and we got a chance to just kind of dig into that. So just making individuals more aware of the different types of disabilities. Again, we're going to talk more of a in a whole um, today, but it's just important to understand. It's not just about disabled bodies being in the space, but also the understanding of welcoming, of making a space welcoming, and um, and that means access, mindset, and all things. So, uh, yeah, thank you for having me. And uh, I'm really excited about Ashley uh, just being <laughs> on this call. Um, so, yeah, Ashley, if you would like to introduce yourself. Okay, okay. <laughs> Hi, everyone. I'm Ashley, um, Chicago, Illinois. And... Let me see a little bit about myself. I have a spinal cord injury. I'm a C4 quadriplegic. They say complete, but I don't know. I regained quite a bit of function back. And um, I'm excited about this topic. I have a clothing brand all with the message to, that I try to spread. We are all human. So I'm really excited about this topic and to talk about Disability Employment Awareness Month and the lack of disability, disability employment in the workspace. I'm excited about this topic. So... Yeah. Yeah. I, have, I have chills when you said, you know, I have a clothing line and um, we're all human because this all came together in such an organic way. Like Wes and I talk with the team about what we would like to talk about and uh, issues that come up currently and, and just stuff. We, we have really fun jam sessions, brainstorming sessions. And that's what we kept landing on. And he was like, you know, I know some people. 
And he, when he says he's excited about you, he really genuinely is. Like, he was like, oh, you need to tap in and connect with her. And, um, and then when I shared with you, like, you know, we are all humans. You're like, that's my clothing line. I was like, oh, the heavens <laughs> opened up. It was um, and that's why we wanted to bring you to the table, too, because such a force. You're a woman. You know what I mean? You're a woman of color. You are um, a woman. I'm so glad you identified what your injury is because me not having a disability, um, you know, we had to go through this whole thing of really diving deep into um, spinal cord injuries the differences between them, how you identify them, and how that's different than somebody who says, you know, they have MS and they're in a wheelchair because maybe they can walk, maybe they can't. It's so important that we see each other where we are, you know? Thank you. Um, and then Ooh. you have your own company. Oh, hold on. <laughs> I like that you started there because I feel right. like Ashley has made a lot of different posts. Um, yeah, I'm throwing you out there. Um, but primarily around like ableism, right? Um, and so, you know, I want you trying to share a little bit, if you don't mind, Ashley, of just kind of like, what, what do you, how do you see that and how that can really affect the workplace and probably the reason why there isn't enough people with disabilities in empl with employment? Yeah, so a big reason, I mean, I never really liked corporate America. Even before my injury, I always wanted to be self-employed. But I can see now as a disabled woman, it's so much easier to be self-employed because you're kind of able to, one, make your own schedule because dis disabled life is, yeah, you're on a routine, but you also got to leave a lot of room for the spontaneous stuff that happens. Like right before this podcast, I just had something happen. So I was like scrambling and like, I'm glad I made it, but you just have to leave room for that. So being self-employed allows for that room and that understanding because a lot of bosses aren't going to be understanding or compassionate about the fact that you have a disability and things are going to not always go as you plan. Absolutely. <laughs> when I think about, um, you know, at least going back into my injury, I was, let's say, I had that mindset to get back to whatever I was doing before, right? And I was working a full-time job, so I got into the job and got right back to eight hours a day. Yeah. And I was working with the same people that I was working with before. So nobody had a disability, right? So nobody could understand my position. It went from eight hours to six hours to four hours to whenever I could go, right? Long story short, they talked me into taking a severance and just leaving the job. I really thought I couldn't work no more. But it was a call center job. I could have worked from home. <laughs> I mean, it wasn't that, you know, um, serious in a sense. And so what I'm getting to is that nobody in that space understood me. As you said, Ashley, like I remember having my first like accident in the workspace because I was trying to, in a way, fit in and make everybody else comfortable. And, and, and in that sense... I was uncomfortable, you know, I was sitting there sweating and having all this. And it's like, so now people are looking at me like there's something wrong with me. And for me, it's like, because I'm trying to fit in with you because there, this space isn't as accepting. And, and over time, I understood that it was the, the ableism within that space of everyone thinking that in a way, the limitations, right? Like, and so my boss didn't really def my boss didn't really see which i which is funny because i respect her you know now she be showing some love and stuff but it's it it definitely was a uh it's crazy right i see you april <laughs> it's crazy because she does show a lot of love and i'm like oh man but you just i could have been a failure in life because you just stripped, stripped away my opportunity due to your lens of how my disability is you know what i mean like not not i mean and that's just real like i still overcame some things but it started there where i felt defeated you know and i think about like just how people see us within those spaces and so like you said like 
there can bring discomfort if you have something that happens and you don't have no wiggle room mm -hmm. and there's no understanding. Um, I am a big advocate for self-employment with disability. And that's crazy, right, April? Like, um, but even think about this. Yeah. College into most colleges aren't accessible. So do you think the workforce wanted people with disabled bodies in there? I know you can do online classes now, but to really get the hands-on work, you go to the bigger colleges, right? Like you go to those universities and you, some have access, but barely. I've been to enough colleges to know there's so much work to be, be done. Um, and so I always think about that too when you think about employment. Most employers haven't seen disabled bodies learning and being educated the same way they were. And I think that's a big, 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 big like exclamation point is that our schools, for me, education is about gaining knowledge and, and, and it's exploration, right? It's diving into what you don't know, um, diving into areas that you really want to really gravitate to and learn more about. It's philosophical to me on, on all levels, but in, in our education system, it's almost training people, train people how to work, train people mm -hmm. how to be nationalistic, train people how to be in corporate America. So you're right. Like, if you don't fit the mold, then you're, you're not trainable mm -hmm. and you're not going to have the access. And that is so discouraging on so many levels. And I've shared with you before, Wes, my... Um, I will shout out Edinburgh University of Pennsylvania, two hours north. I'm in Pittsburgh, Ashley. And um, my son went to school there and he called me one day. It's, I think, like nationally one of the top schools um, for their acceptance rates of uh, persons with disabilities. Mm. And my son called me. And, and you'll see it at a football game everywhere. Folks, all shapes, sizes, colors, wheelchairs, walkers, regular, able, you know, everything. And it's not like, and it should never be. But I remember my son called me one day. He's like, oh, my God. And I was like, what's wrong? What, what happened? What happened? And he was like, I was carrying my boxes in. My son's 6'2", able-bodied football player. I was cable, uh, carrying boxes in. And the dude in front of me opened the door and held the door open for me. It was a guy in a wheelchair. And it was like nothing, it was not a big deal, but he hadn't seen that. He hadn't experienced that. Mm -hmm. And that to me is what is necessary. Why are we hiding behind this veil of disabilities? And, you know, a lot of us have disabilities that are not seen. And yeah. it's like, oh, because you, you have the ability to walk, you can sit at this desk and do the work. And that that person but, could have some serious disabilities. But you could be depressed and dealing with all this. Well, I'm happy. Mm -hmm. You know, but you see my limitations, but that don't mean that. I mean, but I'm not battling nothing internally. I'm pulling out grace and gratitude and all of this. And, you know, you you got all of, you got a mask on. I don't have a mask on. And so, Ashley, think about it. Um, did you ever try to go? Um, well, first you can like, how long have you been injured? I've been injured for about three years and like seven months. Okay. So did you ever try to like get back into work or do anything or did that not even cross your mind um, once you, like once you got injured? Working for me, it has crossed my mind. But like I said, even before, I never wanted to really work in corporate America. I was always trying to do something that I could be like, you know, self-employed and becoming disabled really made me want to do that even more because like what I said earlier, I know that the workforce isn't going to be as accommodating to my disability. Like I wish they would, but it's because they don't understand or like for me, I noticed that a lot of people have this perception of disability, a very narrow one. A lot of it, a lot of people assume this, this uh, a lot of people assume disability is like intellectual disability. Right. They put everybody in that category. I even have a friend who grew up disabled who said for the longest she had a fight to even be in like regular classrooms in school. And just because they assumed that because she was in a wheelchair, she had an intellectual disability. And she was like, no, I can be in the regular classes. Like she had a fight for that for 
a few years in school and like we're in 2022 it shouldn't be like that yeah. like there should be more education on disabilities in the classroom for teachers for doctors yes and for employers as well like that should be like in training yeah i I've feel like that too. I feel like we have to be the trainers, you know, like, yes. I mean, I always, I think one of my favorite quotes right now in this experience is the teacher that owes no favors. Mm. And um, it's because everyone or so many things have been built on opinions, you know, even, you know, certain systems are just opinionated. Yeah. Um, and, you know, that's why they hire consultants, right? Like come in and start to educate them on a proper way to understand the process, the culture or whatever they're bringing. I love that you you shared, you know, even that part of, you know, most people thinking, well, just because you're in a disability category that you just you have them all, <laughs> you know, like you just got you just got them all. And. There's two things that I can think of when you made that comment. One, most people only go off of that one experience they had with disability and they can kind of, and they shape that with everything else. The other thing is it could have been someone else's perception that, that they ended up modeling and molding and then going out and doing it as well. You know, like, I feel like, when you're in the grocery store, right? When the parents say like, no, 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 don't touch. Like, no, you know, you'd be like, and I think most of us have fun with kids, you know, especially when kids look and you want to show them more, right? You want to let them feel the vibe, but it's normally their parents. It's like, oh, I'm sorry, they're this and that. And it's like, most people should be aware that this can happen to them any day. And if they open their minds up to be more empathetic, their fear, we wouldn't have such a large community of people that even now fear with their disability because of the fears they had prior to it. You see what I mean? Because that same parent could say, no, you know, all of this and something happens two months later. Now you are in this position, but Joe's the way you saw me is now how you see yourself. Yeah. You know, and so that becomes debilitating. And that's where like that ableism mindset also kind of comes in. I um, I'm thinking of, of two things. One, a quote that I uh, will share in our newsletter um, and doing some research and stuff. But a, a gentleman named Ed Roberts, who um, was a disability advocate and a disabled guy. And he said there are only two kinds of people in the world, the disabled and the yet to be disabled. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely you, you, you're speaking on that like and we talk about that all the time when we talk about grace and compassion and humanity there are times when at we're all going to be disabled in one way or another you know if we get older you know we might suffer dementia alzheimer's we might have an injury that we that makes us immobile um there, there are a, <laughs> there is a wide spectrum of disabilities that human beings face. Mm -hmm. And Ashley, what you spoke to, like everybody does assume, at least in my my perception too, that you're disabled. So let's put you all together. Like I've taught in classrooms where you know I'll have a couple of kids in a wheelchair. Um, the majority of the class might have um, a behavioral issue based on an emotional disability like there's such a wide spectrum and they just throw everyone in a class together in one room and it's a disservice I feel it's a huge disservice to the teacher to the paraprofessionals who are trying to support and to every single student in there because how can I really customize instruction or even um, vary the instruction to um, help with other groups if you're just throwing everybody in a pot and I have a kid who's like super genius, intelligent, and then another child who might have the, um, the ability of having like a, a second grade intelligence. No one is better than the other person, but it's fair to give them separate paths to follow along on because their disabilities are not the same. Yeah. 
Exactly. So April and Ashley, I want to, um, I know I was throwing out this ableism word a little bit. So yeah. I wanted to go and find the right definition. And I'm happy I did because I feel <laughs> like now we, we can, because it's going to be some questions followed up after this. But just for people to understand why I keep saying there is a level of ableism when it comes into the workspace. The definition for ableism, at least what I'll just find on your simple Google search, anybody want to know? <laughs> um, it says discrimination in favor of able-bodied people. Mm. Um, and examples of that is asking someone what is wrong with them, right? So again, or saying you don't look disabled, right? Um uh, Viewing a person with a disability as inspirational for doing typical things, such as having a career, assuming a physical disability is a product of laziness or lack of exercise. So, Ashley, mm -hmm. when I think about this, right, like, what are some things that people have said to you? Because, of course, you have moving and grooving, right? And I know, of course, you know, so... Have you ever been approached where, because I think I've seen different, it might not have been you, but I have seen it in the wheelchair movement, right? Like someone saying like, you're too pretty to be in a wheelchair, mm. you know, or like something. Have you ever been approached in a way of having like anyone come at you and say something based on those terms? Oh, yeah, for sure. I've had people say I'm too young to be disabled. Wow. To me, that right there shows their lack of education on disabilities. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> You're too young. Yes. Wow. I've gotten that one quite a few times. What? They're like, you're young, like really young. What happened to you? Hmm. Or they assume I was like born like this. Um, especially because for those of you guys who don't know, I do have a twin sister who is also in a wheelchair from the same car accident in 2019. And so people do assume because we're twin sisters that we, we, we were born disabled and we were not. We just happened to both get spinal cord injuries and different ones because she's a paraplegic. I'm a quadriplegic. So that in and of itself is like always an educational moment because having to explain that to people every mm -hmm. time they're like they see us out together because I am always out with her for the most part. They're always curious or assume that we were born like that and then we got to kind of use that as an educational advocacy moment yeah so but i have gotten you're too young you're too pretty all of that all how the ableist that, things how does that feel for you and you you mentioned that you were able to you know listen to jeff and we talked about that that came up as a topic like people walk up and just feel like they could say something to you you you, you know like <laughs> How, how does that feel for you? Like, I don't even know the audacity sometimes. The curiosity, <laughs> I, the curiosity I can understand. So if you've been in a conversation with somebody for a long time, if it's come up and you're like, hey, can I ask permission? Like we do, we talk about that in consulting and coaching. You ask permission to ask questions. Um, but how does that land with you when people engage you and your sister in that way? <laughs> um sorry about that um no, no problem. <laughs> for me i don't know sometimes it, i guess it kind of depends on like what their like demeanor is some people you can tell just cut, like they're just being nosy they don't really want to learn or get educated um like wes said when it's people with the children i always use that as like a moment right. to just interact with the child like a normal human being not totally like educate them I've never done that but I do just like if the parent is like shushing them away I'm like I'll just like be like hi like let the kid know let the parent know that like yeah. I'm a regular human like it's okay that your kid's staring at me and kind of curious about mm -hmm. my chair because I would be too if I was a child I'm, I'm sure so kind of just use those moments just to like humanize myself and let the other people hopefully humanize me just because I Hopefully then, and then too, a big thing for me, a thing I started doing, I wear, and Wes probably saw this back in June when we met, I wear flags on my chair, a Puerto Rican flag, <laughs> because 
I've noticed since I started doing that, people like will recognize me for that instead of my chair. Mm, so maybe that's like a mask I wear maybe a little bit because it helps people see me and not my chair. Like I'm identified as something else. I also put like the LGBT, the pride flag back there. So people start asking me questions about that rather than my disability. And it's, it allows for different conversations. It, it opens the door for the intersections to be Yes. Right. Like I talk about it all the time. You know, you probably see a lot of my posts and I'm always referencing being just a black man because I feel like I want to be seen as that, as just a normal human, as someone that embraces my culture and other things outside of my physical limitations, you know, because then when you put just in, like you said, because when people go narrow minded and say, oh, well, disability, right? Now you're just part of this whole group when you represent so much more. And that's, again, I like how you said that, like most workplaces and spaces and, you know, even when you go in for hospitality, right? They put you in that group instead of really focusing on who you are and like what things that, you know, that you represent. So I really like that you shared that. And throughout that term that we, we you know, we needed to put emphasis on anyway. <laughs> yeah, and I, that's a good point of education um, because ableism, it for me, it, it's so infused in our culture, just like patriarchal, you know, systems are that I, I it's almost subconscious. I guess that's what I want to say. It's just so subconscious and not bringing awareness to it um, doesn't excuse the behavior you know, and it's so important to speak about it. And when we talk about the workplace, that is the key thing right there. How do you humanize every single person? You talk about customer service, right? Like treat every customer with respect and have them walk in the door and they're, the customer's always right. Well, how come? <laughs> everybody, everybody doesn't have the Chick-fil-A motto. <laughs> right like most people already put their opinions and, and perceptions in customer service you know and April I'm sure you have experienced it Ashley I'm, I'm sure you have as well um, where you go in and maybe because someone views you different that's the service you get you know yeah. and and instead of just thank you have a good day right like Chick-fil-A like everybody they see everybody get the same love right Right. You don't get the same love when it comes to certain services, right? If someone sees you as a person with a disability and they don't see it as just normal um, in their world, then they will treat you different. There'll be a limitation. You'll be, hold on, hold on, hold on. I need to do this. Hold on, hold on, hold on. You can't do that, right? Like I've been in places where I've been boxed in and I'm like, dude, you know, and it's just, again, even just, you know, we talk about it when it comes to, um, I do my videos when people are like harassing me in like the parking spots or something because it's not based on their perception as well. You know, my car, Ashley, like people see me in it, they don't think I'm in a wheelchair, you know? And so they, they so like if I'm going to go get valet or something, it's like I have to explain to someone um, or what was it, April, when I just, I, I was just in LA At the beach. and I went through parking and they give you free parking if you have a disability and a placard. My placard was on there because of course I have, I moved to LA as most people know and um, with boxes in the back while I'm in Kansas City. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, I had the placard, everything, go through the mm -hmm. line. I mean, go through the gate. And the guy would not, my wheelchair was next to oh, me. Oh, yeah. But yeah. the guy would not allow me to get in for free. I was fine with paying because I wanted to go see the beach. I was going for something different. He wasn't going to steal that from me. Okay. But it was $18. So I'm like, okay, I'll pay this $18 after going back and forth with him. I go park. I get out. He see me in a wheelchair. He stops me. He was like, oh, I didn't know you were really in a wheelchair. I'm like, after all this we just talked about, he said, so come back and I'll let you get your money back. I said, okay. Went to go have some coffee. Well, no, some tea. I had a matcha. 
<laughs> went to go have some tea, watched, looked over the beach, came back, got in my car, w- tried to go get the refund. By this time, he's telling me I can't get the money back because I needed to go get back in the car to get the ticket to bring to him right once he saw me. And I'm like, so do you want me to get back in the car and make it inconveniencing on my body to grab something that was in the dashboard? It made more, it would be easier just for me to do it when I, anyway, I caught it on video where he was basically explaining how until he seen me in the wheelchair, he didn't believe that I was in the wheelchair. And so again, and that was customer service. Now imagine someone that didn't have the money and just went because they knew that that was something that, that they were supposed to do. It could have been an argument, but do we win when we argue? You know what I mean? Like, what does that do for us? At least I know when my body, when I argue, I don't like the way my body feel. It's like trigger all right. type of stuff. Right. Like, my nerves just go crazy. Right. So it's like, again, just wanted to use that as an example because that was the experience that I, I had to deal with. In April, I went back like a couple of days later. <laughs> I did. I went back. I pulled up like, yeah, man, don't. Yeah, you know me. Like, it's like, me. <laughs> like, just go, just go. I'm like. <laughs> he was like, I'm not, no smoke. It was like that. He looked, his eyes got big. I, I think he just thought I maybe was a visitor or, or a tourist, so I probably wasn't going to come back. But no, that's my spot. Yeah. <laughs> he going to yeah. see me a lot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, um, you know, with it being Disability um, Awareness Month, and we talk about like intersectionalities, like Ashley, you talked about voting Puerto Rican, you know, Wesley, I I shared with him that I felt like um, part of what he went through was one, a black man in a nice car, um, I I think is racism on top of uh, being discriminatory um, with the disability. Um, I I can't even believe dude did that, but that's a whole nother story. So, Ashley, how have you found those intersections um, for yourself coming into play with other people? Or have you? Hmm. So I know that I'm very, like, I'm very white passing, especially when my hair is straight. I have fair skin. I dye my hair, so it's kind of blonde. Um so I can be white passing and like my facial features are pretty, like I, I resemble more of my dad and he's Native American slash Creole. So I don't really resemble like a Puerto Rican, just a little because I do get that I look Puerto Rican. But <laughs> I know that I am white passing and that is a privilege. Um, so I haven't really dealt with too much of like the racism side, I will say. I have people when I was younger, I had people call me some racist, some um, like Hispanic slurs. Mm -hmm. Um, but since I've become disabled more of it has to do with my disability people discriminating me against and and then my age so maybe like is that ageism I don't Mm -hmm. like people assume that I'm younger than I am or even that I'm just the age that I am they just assume that I'm like like not as smart or not as educated and shouldn't be talking on my life as a disabled person and I'm like no like I feel like the more you can learn the most from people that are actually living with the disability. So I'm a big believer in that. <laughs> oh, God. Th- thanks for bringing those, those things up because there is, I-, I appreciate you acknowledging, like there is a part sometimes if you're a little closer white adjacent, right? Um, which I think gives a beautiful lens too, because you, you see it. You know what I mean? You're like, uh huh, I got you. If I was just a little brown, or if my hair was in the curls, you would probably <laughs> act different. Um, and that ageism thing is a big, big deal. And I know, even as like an able-bodied person, I have three boys. I look a lot younger than I am, and I've gotten to the point like I don't put my years on my resume or anything like that because I know. I feel people are just going to discriminate because of that. And then I remember when I had my kids, which I didn't even have until I was 30, I, people treated me like, look at this little young, young black girl with all these kids, you know, they put me into this stereotype. And like you said, they would talk to me like I'm not educated or, you know, they would look at the person next to me as opposed to me. Now I'm the one who's running the show, but they're going to look at somebody who's my employee (laughs) 
to get answers to. And that's that's when we're talking about the intersectionality of the things we have to deal with layered on top of, like you said, they're seeing your disability first. Mm-hmm. And then they're going to be like, you're too young to even talk about this stuff. Like, what? It's it's like they put, they, they oh, the fact that even in customer service, if you are with an able-bodied person, they most likely have the, or want to talk to them for you, right? Have you ever had that, Ashley? Like someone is trying to like talk to maybe like if you're with your dad or somebody, right? Like, and they want to, um, you know, they talk at them and because they think less of you. Yes, all the time. And I take it even one step further. When I'm with my sister, who is in a wheelchair, she's in a manual wheelchair, though. They will talk to her over me because I am in a power chair and they assume that I'm like more disabled, if you will. Mm. I get that. We get that happen all the time. Really? They'll just talk to her and I'm like, I can speak for myself. I'm right here. <laughs> like every time we're out to eat, what do you guys want? And they just look right at her and I'm like, I can order for myself. A lot of the times I'm the one that orders for us. So, <laughs> <laughs> and you know, it's funny. I feel like, and that's how like the, it gets switched. Cause I know I experience it too. And like, I find myself ordering for everybody or like, they'll always talk to somebody else. I don't care. I could be the flies guy down there <laughs> looking all independent and they still going to talk to the person that they can relate to, you know? And I'm like, man, like I've had people like, no, you need to talk to him. You know what I mean? Like, um, like he's paying the bill. <laughs> exactly. But then that, then that shifts my energy. Like it's good to educate, but then I get to a point where, that that that's a level of frustration when you have to continue to educate like right. and because there are certain times when people's ignorance you know can become debilitating and the way they treat you is probably how like everybody doesn't doesn't change. it's so crazy y'all why am i talking about this and my tea <laughs> my tea has messages right i always share it on my story it says compassion is a strength <laughs> because that's what I was about to say it's like because when you have that ignorance you lack that compassion and you're not pushing it out so when, people, when you don't feel that compassion it's hard to yeah. try to you, you know it's hard to just try to educate somebody in those moments you know and, and, and again because it's not it could be something that they was taught but a lot of people only go off of what they do and I remember movies where the caretaker would be the one speaking right like people go off of just what they have visually seen yeah and it's crazy that most of society has been influenced of, of the lens of disability from media tv and advertising yes. and, that, and, that was, perspective. and it's only been one lens mm-hmm. for so long and it has been the sick, the the intellectual, like you see what I mean? Like it's been that model that majority has seen. Mm-hmm. And that that those people at that higher level, they're not looking at Instagram, seeing the Ashleys or the and the Wesleys <laughs> of the world, right? Like they're not. They end up seeing me at a, a convention when I'm speaking to them or something, and it's the first time they hear the story, you know, or understand that there's a difference. Like, and so again, like understanding that can to help us like where do we find ourselves and i think just it goes right back into what ashley talking of just again if you want to hire a person with a disability please just be empathetic they would we love to work you know but we want to know we want our worth as well we want to be valued for our time and our respect but that's why we push the self-employment tool the the um entrepreneur tool because there are so many ways that people think of you and if they're talking at talking to somebody for you in just a normal setting what they're going to do if you just work in there they probably wouldn't even talk to you Mm -hmm. i would only imagine how many people with disabilities probably be avoided in a workspace yeah you know like and that's a serious thing i'm sure we could go to Dr. Google and I'm sure there's stories, but at the, I mean, I experienced things just from travel, 
I experienced things like, oh, I literally missed my flight. Like, yesterday was bad. And I'm just happy that I had some good people yeah. in the airport in Dallas. And they just took care of me and got me home last night, no matter how late it was. Yeah. And so, again, and but those were compassionate people compared to the first location I went to. And I'm back at it again tomorrow morning. So, you know, so I experience these things constantly. Hotels where they tell me, hey, we got a shower chair up there to go all the way up there and there's no shower chair. There's no. So I got to go all the way back down. Like there's nobody walking up and down to do this. And I'm pushing. Right. Like I'm pushing. I'm opening up heavy doors. But they want you just come on back down, you know, and come back in. And so, again, it's like when people see things, how can you? What what does it look like when you're right on the side of them for employment, right? Like, don't use me as a quota. Oh, that's powerful. That's powerful, right? <laughs> mm-hmm. Like, don't don't because you need three or four disabled bodies before y'all go into this little, you know, to check on this who's all here, right? Like, right. And that's real, you know. And it's like I just fit in a box, but you never even educated. <clears throat> I feel like even. But that's where it comes in. If you want to hire people with disabilities, you should go through the steps of understanding disability and then teaching every employee about disability, not from just an employment standpoint, but also from a service standpoint. Because most people just get hired. And I, I think I just met most people get hired and... They're hiring individuals without educating them with disability. Your whole structure, your handbook, everything can say that you represent disability. You you respect the ADA Act, all of these things. But the employee, you never told them. You never taught them. Yeah. So that's who's servicing. That's who's representing you. Yeah. You got to go and do the work outside of your own head and educate the people that are helping you serve, because if not, then their service to us is what we're receiving. That put that's why you see the wheelchairs broken in the airports. That's why you, you know, you see all these different stories, the hospitality like I've done, you know, uh, sink baths and stuff like because lack of education that trickles down from the leadership. They say if the leadership is not making the, the impact and everyone down at the, below that, they have the same mindset, right? Yeah. So. You know, it doesn't matter to me, like the percentage of persons, like if you have one disabled person in the building, then you have one. If you have none, you still learn. Like if you have yeah. no black folks, you have no Asian folks, like, it's to me very important to understand one, Ashley, we're all human, right? <laughs> That's where you start. You just start with we're all human and how do we connect with humans and, and give them that grace? Like, Ashley, it's, you know, we've talked about, like, I've talked to our team about, um, and, you know, I say CPT, and you probably can't say color folk, but, you know, I'm like, hey, culturally, like most cultures that like are indigenous cultures, starting on time is not a thing. Like in some cultures, it's disrespected um, to show up early to folks' places. And then, you know, like we just don't do that. And so I make allowances for that. You know, it's like, I, I, I know our people, like. We're going to be late. We're going to be late. And then, <laughs> like, add another five, 10 minutes on when you have the disability. So we call it CPD time. Yep, yep. <laughs> you brought that, you you shared that. And it's like, those are the things that it's important to see. You know what? Like, there, there's a war. You, you know, people are, um, we're all happy to be alive. And so why are we getting so uptight and putting so many stressors on each other? for not fitting into that box. And so my question to both of you, and I'll, you know, throw it to you, Ashley, is what would ideally, like, what would you like to see in the workplace? Like, what are some ideal things you'd like to see in the workplace to support that concept that we've been talking about, you know, seeing everybody as human and, and, and giving space for all people, especially those with disabilities. Oh, wow. Good question. Good question. Um, Universal design, 
first off, because that always helps everyone. Um, letting disabled people into the workplace, first and foremost, whether they work there or not, we should all be able to access every building. Um, I don't know, I feel like a lot of it comes down to just like constant education and training. And before my injury, I actually worked in, I lived in Kansas City. Oh. And uh, I worked at a, I worked, it was, I worked in sales, but I worked at a company that trained other companies. And I will say, looking back, they did not have no disability. We had a whole bunch of trainings, but we did not have any disability education trainings or um, speakers that spoke on those subjects for different like companies that we worked with. And looking back, I'm like, that needs to be implemented, just like they do sexual harassment training yearly. There should be disability education training yearly, as well as multiple other factors in the workplace because you want to make sure that you're always including everyone and like Wes said being compassionate towards everyone in the workplace and that goes for like the mental disabilities they have the physical disabilities that they have the problems that they may be having that go beyond like health and mental well-being because people need time to just breathe sometimes Mm -hmm. and our workplace is not accommodating at all even in terms like going beyond disability they're just not Mm. understanding and that goes back to why you want to be self-employed sometimes (laughs) Mm -hmm. there was a a twitter a a tweet i saw from somebody who or linkedin or something um and this person uh, was going in for their (laughs) top surgery and i think they had their own company or whatever because they were talking about like they could do it now whereas before they couldn't go get a top surgery done because it wasn't covered you know under insurance and their employer wouldn't give them the time off for that why would you not let somebody have time off to get a top surgery but you barely give time for women to have a baby you know what i mean like when you said it needs to go beyond all of that or i remember just the stress, uh, uh, I decided to stay home to raise my kids. And thank God I was blessed enough to do that. But I remember the stress of times like, wake up, somebody's throwing up, mm-hmm. wake up, somebody's sick. I mean, it literally, my son got injured at football, literally couldn't walk, you know, and the stress of like, oh, I can't go to work, I have to call them and feeling even more bad about that mm-hmm. than taking care of my family. So when you say, yeah, it goes beyond, you know, again, we're all human beings. We're all going to have things that happen to us. So. I think, you know, just I'll, to kind of dig into that. Cause I, I mean, that was a great question too, April. Mm-hmm. Um, just like I actually said, access, access just makes sense. Um, I'm, I'm right now and I'm at this point of like, go where you're celebrated, not tolerated. So everywhere I go, I'm like, oh, I'm celebrating. Let's go, right? <laughs> so I was just in Canada for a week. That's where I came from. And um, okay. yeah, it was pretty dope. Uh, did a lot of stuff. Did some mountain biking, yeah, through the forest. Oh, wow. It was crazy. Um, but there was acknowledgement of where access was everywhere. There was signage everywhere. I wouldn't say it was great on a parking didn't see a lot of parking spots um, with accessible signs, but I know that when I got out, there was a way to show me everywhere to find access. And then when I went to a bathroom, it was just this one wheelchair sample. And it was like a lot of them have your own private bathroom for people, you know, with disabilities in a sense. Those were just very welcoming. Every door had a button. I mean, there was no, like, I could barely find doors without a button. Actually, even bathrooms and markets had buttons. And I know you know that these bathrooms don't have buttons, especially like most places, right? <laughs> like, and so I was just like, I got this in a grocery store in the bathroom. It was a button at the door. It was a button by the toilet. It was button it behind it. It was just access, right? Mm-hmm. And so I felt good being in these places that even if there was certain challenges like cobblestone <laughs> roads and stuff like that, it didn't really bother me because I knew they they made a way or at least acknowledged, right? And then like, to, so 
to me, access just makes sense because that's when you know that you have been in there, um, that you're being welcome. Um, the other thing I think for me, I would like to just see, of course, the training. The training makes sense. Um, the training in all different things. Um, but I think, you know, I would like to see me in a lot of these rooms educating <laughs> too. I'm not going to lie. You know, I have to let That'd them know. Cool. Hey, Ira Wesley. Uh, <laughs> I was going to say that, like you, you no. ADA consulting, you know, as part of the EIJ. Ashley, I don't know if you do consulting and stuff. Would I know you have your, your company. We're going to buy some gear. <laughs> um, but um, how do you, you said you don't do a lot of educating, but you do have a platform. Yeah that you use how do you reach out to people and how can people find you okay okay um so a big i do use social media as a big tool um and then i'm also on a podcast the lift to roll podcast um so that's like a way i learned to like educate and my sister and i we also have a youtube channel where we show just one just us living life as disabled women because you need to, I feel like the best thing you can do to advocate is just live your life and be out there in the community mm -hmm. showing that you exist. Like, I feel like that was a big reason why I even started my clothing brand was because I just wanted to be, there's not a lot of, you don't see a lot of us in Chicago out in the community. And so I was like, you know what? The first start is one of us being out there and being in these rooms and letting these people see that we exist so that they can start making these places more accessible. Yeah. And, okay, sorry, I like got off the topic or the question no. that you asked, but. Uh, no, you're answered it. Like, and I wrote this <laughs> down, like, I'm going to share your podcast. I was asking like how you teach, how you get out. Yeah. Like, what do you do? Um, and um, I know Wesley does kind of all the same thing. He doesn't have a clothing brand though, but we may have just given him a thing, but. Well, you he, know, <laughs> disabled, but not true. really. Mike, but like, oh, yeah, disabled, but not really. But personally, <laughs> you know. He does. Yeah, Ashley don't wear some gear. Thanks, love. <laughs> <laughs> I got my shirt. I be wearing it and my hat. <laughs> nice. Um, um, and let me ask you as we're coming close to this hour, like, what do you do to take care? We a lot of the stuff we talked about is stress. You, you know, we talk about trauma and we talk about how how it affects the body you know just like Wesley's like I don't like how I feel when I'm arguing or when I have to get in these confrontations and that's a big part of our platform is that we've suffered so much trauma and like how do we take care of our bodies or our, 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 when I say bodies I mean our nervous systems how do we bring our nervous systems down so that we can be capable to to take care of ourselves so what do you what do you do for that what do you listen to what do you read what, what are some things that help you with your your mindful state okay okay so I do a lot of different things I like to I meditate um I'm big on meditating um and then I love to read I I'm big on educating myself too so besides just educating other people, I like to educate myself. If I don't know something, I'm not afraid to admit I don't know it and look it up, do a Google search, read a book about it. Um, <laughs> recently, I've been really big on autobiographies Ooh. and like memoirs and just reading other people's stories of like triumph or whatever they're talking about, really. Um, and then another thing I really like to do, I love music. And I know in like the, the podcast I was just watching of your guys is you guys were talking about being more cautious of the things you consume and like listen to. So mm -hmm. I've noticed that I've been being more like cautious of all that as well. The um, mm -hmm. music just makes me happy. And so I do love that. And that's like something that I, I know that I, I like to do personally because it helps keep my mind right. Because it just music just, I don't know, it just makes me happy. Yeah. But reading, educating, meditating. Um, a lot of little things and, and then trying to always stay up to date on learning and educating people on disabilities because I didn't, I, I'm, like I said, I'm only three years and like seven months out. And so I'm still learning. Mm. And so I'm not afraid to admit when I probably still have some ableist thoughts right. on disabilities. So I'm always wanting to learn from people like Wes out in the community or 
anybody yeah. else like my sister even she's educates or like Maya Hendrix anybody really I just Maya I feel like that's the most important and especially for quadriplegics because you don't see a lot of quadriplegic women really like showing their life out on social media and I understand it's hard yeah. as a woman to like lose your hand function and lose like your ability to do a lot of things that make you feel like feminine I guess especially if you like you don't want to experience like and feel feminine if that was like your aura yeah. and so I get that it's hard and that's why it was important to me even from the moment I became disabled to show the good the bad the ebb and flow of living life as a quadriplegic woman because it's not always easy right but we're out here trying to be women and trying to show that we are all just human and experiencing yeah. life healing growing and doing all the things so yeah yeah I thanks for that. sharing that you share one i'm gonna get back i'm gonna ask you a book you might want to throw out to the audience but I feel, I think it's the first time, Wesley, that somebody has said, although I am this person and this is the state that my body is in now, I'm still learning. I'm still growing. I'm still, you know, trying to continuously heal um, and learn at the same time as I'm trying to educate others. That's, oof, that's powerful. Um, it's funny, it's not funny, but it's it, yeah, it is <laughs> funny that it just full circle. I had a pen when I was in Canada. I went to this, um, I went to go learn about these uh Native American tribes called First Communities, okay, and First Nations. Sorry, sorry, <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah, laughs> <sisters. laughs> ancestors, and it was it was crazy. They gave me a pen that said, I'm listening and I'm learning. You know, and so like for you to say that, but I've, I've I always referenced myself as a student of life because I'm learning in every experience I go through, you know, and I get to educate, you know, and I, and I you know, so it, I love that you added that. And um, I love that you just read too, girl. Yeah, what do you mean? <laughs> you sell all your books, but is there something you would like to share with the audience? Because we're, we're big readers. Yes. Around okay, here. okay. So I read, um, if you guys know the rapper Logic, yep. I read his autobiography. Um, I forget the title of it, but it was really good. His life is was very, very interesting. I read Russ's memoir. It was not so much autobiography. His was more about his music and how he kind of like manifested his career. Um, I was another book I recently read. I've been reading, I know these are like more like high school reads, but um, like to the Arthur of Tuesday with Maury. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I've been reading his books. I read like the Five People You Meet in Heaven, mm -hmm. and they were like they're nonfiction, but they were nice. They were cute, a little self help slash like lessons you learn. Um, Women don't owe you pretty. Ooh, by Florence Given. That was a really good book that I read recently. Nice. Um, pretty. Who's that by? Florence Given. Okay. I believe. I have over there. And then I really like poetry books like mm. Homebody, Rue Capri. I hope I'm saying her name right. Um, R.H. Sin, Courtney Pepper Neal. Those poetry artists. I like poetry books. Well, you know what? I think we had a few poetry books referenced before, so I think we we got we normally share our book lists and things. So we have to share it with you since you're a reader. Oh uh, yes, I like that. I really, I'm gonna have to I get more. Into, I mean, I do list what I mean. I've uh, read like Rick Ross's and Nipsey okay. Hussle, or at least the one that was wrote on him. And so I do read a couple. I like stories too, so. Yes, I go through phases of like what I'm reading. I used to really like the, the self-help books at one point, And mm -hmm. recently it's been autobiographies mm -hmm. and nonfiction. I like that. Well, I wrote that down and I might reach out for you to get that list so we could share with other yes, people. Yes, yes. Um, and I appreciate that because, yeah, we're always, that's something that Wes and I connect on. And the meditation, thank you for sharing that too. Yes, because yes. we've been trying to share with, with everyone, like, being mindful can really help center us all. What are you reading, April? 
Um, oh, oh, I'm reading Emergent Strategy, which is kind of we've been doing it as a team for work, but it's by Adrian Marie Brown. Are you guys familiar with her? She's um, a big like activist. Um, she she's queer. She she's black. She's biracial. She her uh, social media is hilarious. Um, and in consulting, Wes, I think you would totally like it. You too, Ashley. But it's emergent strategy. Uh, the concept kind of of the book is that, you know, the way that we consult and, and do business is very patriarchal, is very white centered. And it's not about like a, a collectivism. And in, in our cultures, we're, we're more in, in a collective space. So um, she kind of bases it on like science fiction. She loves Octavia Butler. Um, so Emergent Strategy by Adrienne Marie Brown. Okay. Is okay. I'm adding that yeah. to my list. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and Ashley, I love Viola Davis. Is that the the? Oh yes, that's on my list. Biography. Oof. That I'm currently reading Tamara Mari's. Oh. Uh, like autobiography she came out with. I'm listening to it on Audible, and I don't totally like listening to it on Audible. Um, I, love. I might prefer the read, but. We'll see. I'm trying. Okay. I mean, is like friends. Yeah. <laughs> and Viola Davis is, uh, I have the book and I listen to it on Audible because it's her the whole time. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I like that. I like that. I listen to most of my books on Audible now just because yeah. it's easier with this lifestyle. It is more, it is more <laughs> yeah. convenient, right? Um, I do um, this. Uh, I'm reading this book called Levels of Energy. Oh, okay. And um, it's really just it's really just honed into a lot for me. It, it separates you from like mindset, it's like going from level zero to fifty all the way up to five hundred plus. So it's just a beautiful thing to learn mm -hmm. um, where I am in life with the mindset, right, and the level I am and where I can be. Um, so. That's that's that. And then I'm being tapped into this book called Achieve with Accountability. OK, um, so um, it's more about workplace and trying to help with your, your team by being accountable. Um, so I guess that is a good book to, you know, share with people mm -hmm. today. Right. Like so yes. if you can be accountable for your own thoughts and feelings and actions and you can start making a better team. Um, <laughs> yeah, I could end with that one. Um, if you, you know, yeah. good book to end with for today. Great. Oh my gosh, Ashley, thank you so much. Thank and we'd you. love to have you come on again. We would love to have you and your sister. What do you think, Wesley? If we Absolutely. have on, yes. if willing to do that, we would love to have you on sooner rather yes. than later. Um, yes. to share your story and to share your business and you know what I see when I see you as a woman of power. That that's the first thing I see. Like I went on your website. I, I was like, she has a clothing line. I went on there. I told everybody I was going to get it. I didn't get the T-shirt before we got on, but um, that's an aspiration for me. You know, I waited a long, many decades before I said like, I can do this on my own, have my own business, and do my own thing because I was stuck in that box that I couldn't. You know, and that's as a a, a woman who seemingly has some ability you know what i mean so um i appreciate wes uh connecting us with you and you being so willing to share what you advocate for and what you believe in yeah thank you i feel like i definitely want to be back on because i feel like there's so much more we could talk about um always yeah. always right? always right this was so mm -hmm. nice i'm well, you're so you. sweet thanks for saying all those sweet things that was really really nice every every single one <laughs> Um, and like, I love that we kind of all have the black theme going on. I know yours is like a dark gray, Ashley. Right. You know, right? <laughs> I'm cold. The heat's not working in my house, so I'm cold. Oh, yeah. It's chilly here. Too. <laughs> I guess we're all on the East Coast, so we're a Midwest <laughs> East Coast. We're cold. <laughs> yeah. 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 I'm in Michigan tomorrow, so. Oh, yeah. <laughs> close to me then. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Wait, and before we really, really get off, you lived in Kansas City. Like, did any connection? Did you guys know each other prior? No, I wish that would have been cool. <laughs> right. <laughs> no, we met back in June. So we just, well, in person, more or less. Yeah. We finally got to meet. When you said that, I was like, I thought you had just met Wes and here another connection. <laughs> yeah, right? that's crazy. 
Yeah, but that's actually what, because, you know, at first I didn't follow a lot of paraplegics. <laughs> but the reason I followed him is because I was like, oh, he's from Kansas City. And I thought that was, like, connected us. So I was intrigued. <laughs> cool. That's cool. Well, hey, everybody. Happy Sunday. Yes, happy, happy Sunday. Sunday. It's football. It's football Sunday. Oh, April. yes. Oh, I got it. <clears throat> I can't for a reason. <laughs> <laughs> Millers are having a little bit of an issue, so I'm not gonna say nothing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So. Are you a Bears fan, Ashley, or Chiefs, or are you any Bears? About Bears. I mean, not. I'm Bears yeah. because my dad's a Bears fan. I don't know anything about football. I love it. I love, I love it. it. <laughs> All right. Well, we're gonna go off live. Thank you, everybody. Yes, thank you. <laughs> Thank you for joining us and listening to the podcast. If you would like more information on the guests and the stories that you've heard today and to hear stories from others, subscribe to the podcast. We also invite you to subscribe to Open Up Pittsburgh's newsletter as well as our YouTube channel. We want you all to take care and remember to make your own stories. This is April. Peace. <laughs>